Roger Norrington rang me up and said, would you like to come and direct an opera? And I said, well, I, I have never directed an opera. I've never had any ambition to do it, and I don't know how to do it. I'm totally familiar with Beethoven, Mozart, Brahms, and so forth, but I knew nothing about opera, and I, don't, I can't read music, and he assured me that he could, so that would be all right. Yes, it, it, it's on that. It's on that that you that, that you, un, that you unfreeze. And it's, I like to work uh, in forms of theatre where there is not an obligation to be uh, spuriously glamorous. And I think that uh, in a company which is small and which doesn't have a big house and where there's a very close association between the orchestra and the players on the stage, it's much easier to have a direct form of drama where all that you attend to is the drama and the music and nothing else. He had this tremendous uh, vision about how pieces should look and uh, what they should be like and of course the, hist the history. Jonathan had a marvellous idea visually. Very often he found an artist of the same period, and this was a very uh, brilliant solution. He used Poussin, the French artist who, who, who moved to Italy and worked there most of his life. My wife reminded me of that scene in Some Like It Hot, where the policeman accuses George Raft of having done the St. Valentine's Day massacre, or the equivalent of it. Sir Maestro, where were you at three o'clock on St. Valentine's Day? Me? I was at Rigoletto. And he turns to his bodyguard, that ain't that so, and the bodyguard says, that's right. We was with you at Rigoletto's. Hermes! And I thought, well, actually, the world of mafia thugs and... Dukes is indistinguishable from the world of Medici thugs. The way he identifies the Duke with the jukebox is a perfect way of characterizing the Duke's shallowness. Women abandon us, why should it hurt them? It's got to be somewhere where, in fact, some way of revisualizing the work occurs precisely because there is a high degree of correspondence from the social structures from which it's come and the social structures into which you put it. But when it comes to Cosi Fantuti, I've done five different productions of it, most of which have been traditionally set in the 18th century. I suddenly decided I must do it a different way. called me up, he was on the phone, and he said, he said, I'm doing the Mikado. 
and I'd like you to come and be Coco. And I said, wow, what are you going to do with the Mikado? And he said, I'm going to get rid of all that Japanese nonsense for a start. <laughs> and I thought, well, this I have to see. <laughs> seen a Gilbert and Sullivan, but then I hadn't seen many operas anyway, and the last operas I think I would likely to have seen of these coy English sort of sillinesses. I cannot believe the Japanese world, the people with these potty training names like Nanki Poo and Poo Bar. Have we done our Nanki Poos? Um, I mean, it was ridiculous to set it in Japan. And then I suddenly remembered that Groucho Marx had taken part in a version of the Mikado. He'd played Coco in it. So I began to think, and I said, oh, actually, how about duck soup? Fredonia, rather than Japan. We'll get him a rousing cheer, to show him we're glad he's here. There's a moment when Groucho gets summoned and comes down to the meeting in duck soup. I make the entrance of the Mikado exactly like that. I base it entirely on what happened in Duck Soup. And he mixed that, the Duck Soup, the Marx Brothers and the black and white look and this sort of crazy, you know, behavior. And he wanted everybody to talk like the Queen. So they talked a bit like that in English received accents, which in those days everybody spoke like, particularly at the BBC. Taken from the county jails by a set of curious chances, liberated then on bail on my own recognizances. Eric had reluctance about being in the opera uh, because he didn't think he could sing well enough, but he turned out he could sing perfectly well enough to do a Gilbert and Sullivan. Um, no great challenges to the voice. And uh, he was very funny, and we had a very good time together. In your uh, anxiety to carry out my wishes, you have beheaded the heir to the throne of Japan. Yes, I think there should be as if this is a... Um, uh, yes, I, I, I have, in a way. I mean, there should be that sort of feeling of the, the hand movements used to set... Yeah, oh, no, no. <laughs> Stop that! Stop that! <laughs> They were filming a documentary, and I remember making him laugh, and he rolled around the floor. I think I groveled. I think I was just doing a grovel. And he went. He just completely went. Come, come, my fellow. Don't distress yourself. <laughs> yes, I Yes, I do. Apology. Absolutely. He just was completely out of control, rolling around the floor, laughing and laughing and laughing, and I thought... I made Jonathan Miller laugh. I'm very happy now. <laughs> OK. <laughs> I think we're having a break for coffee soon. It's fun, that's all. I beg to offer an unqualified apology. It's a funny musical. Or at least I've made it funny, as opposed to facetious. <laughs>